Well, hi the frickin' ho there, people. This is the start of Unit 7. This will be the last unit that we go over before we start preparing for the AP exam, which will be coming up. Okay. Uh, chapter 7, Day 1, we are going to start with integrals as net change. And we have our friend the bumblebee here. Uh, why? I have no idea. No, no, I do. Spring is right around the corner. You can feel spring's warm touch in the air. And uh, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know where it's going with that. Oh, I do. I actually use some bumblebee things here um, in the lesson. Look at me go. So, first of all, let's compare. <laughs> let's compare distance traveled versus displacement. Okay? Uh, a honeybee makes several trips from the hive to a flower garden. The velocity graph is shown below. Now, area under the curve represents total distance. Okay, when we first learned about integrations and integrals, anti-differentiation, whatever, we learned that integrals really measure the area under the curve, okay? In our case, if the curve is velocity and we integrate, we go backwards, we get distance or position, don't we? We do. So, we have this graph here, okay? And this represents our B's path here, which means from zero to two, okay, minutes, he went 100 feet away, right, from the, and then he stayed there, then he came 100 feet back, whatever. So that's 200 feet. So it's area, two times 100. This area is 200 feet. Okay, and actually, um, that's the speed he went. It's 100 feet per minute. I lied. If he goes 100 feet per minute, his velocity for two minutes, that's not there and back. That's just to get to the flower garden from his hive, 200 feet. It's still 100 times two. My bad. Sorry for that uh, explanation. The way back, okay, the 200 feet on the way back is this one right here. Okay, and so forth. So he goes out to the flower garden from the hive, 200 feet away, comes back 200 feet, goes back out 200 feet away, and then he comes 100 feet back, and who knows, maybe a bird ate him. I don't know. Such is the way nature is. It's so devastating and horrific, but math is so cool. Anyways, if I look at the total distance this bee traveled, I don't care about his displacement, like how far he is from where he started. That's displacement. Okay, I'm talking total distance he traveled. Well, all I do is I add these things. He went 200 feet to the flower garden. He went, came 200 feet back. That's 400 feet he's traveled. Went another 200 feet. That's 600 feet. And then he uh, came back 100 feet and met his demise. Or I don't know, maybe he's just stopping to take a little tinkle. I don't know, bees probably got to use the bathroom at some point too. Or, you know, maybe saw a girl bee and was like, hey, what's up? Well, then nothing. What you doing? Just carrying some nectar and honey. No, I don't know. I'm just joking. Anyways, what's the total distance? Well, we add all these things up. Did you like how the bee just floated away like that? It's a cool little graphic. Anyways, I add it all up, and he actually flew 700 feet. Displacement, on the other hand, that is how far away is he from where he started? Well, he started at his hive. He went 200 feet away and came 200 feet back. So really, after he comes back, he is really not any farther from where he started. He's still at his hive. Then he goes 200 feet away again and only comes back 100 feet. So at this point, he's still 100 feet away from his hive. He has to fly another 100 feet to get back to his hive. So he is technically 100 feet away from where he started. Okay, and that's what displacement is. And ready? Bye. There you go. So what do I do in this case? Anything that is in my negatives. You see how these are negative values for velocity? These are positives, right? If this is the graph of velocity, positive, negative, I make or I assign the areas under the curve where my velocity is negative to be negative, meaning I have a positive 200, 
and then I have a minus 200. Okay, so if he just went to the flower garden and back, technically he is right back where he started from. There is a net change. There is a displacement of zero feet. But then he flew another 200 feet away, and he only came back. That's under the x-axis, right? He only came back 100 feet. So he is technically still 100 feet away from where that little worker bee started. And that is displacement. Okay? So when it comes to areas under the curve, we can have total distance or we can have displacement. It's true. Why would I lie? Okay? Therefore, okay, if I am talking about displacement, okay, how far away from the beginning, that is just a normal integration. Okay, that's a normal integration. What does that mean? Anytime we integrate anything like this, okay, it's displacement. All right? This is any normal integration because it's talking about the value of a number, right? Numbers can be positive and numbers can be negative. So we need to account for them accordingly. Total distance traveled, okay? Total distance traveled, you're going to see one minor change. That's where these absolute value bars come in. That means even if I have a negative area under the curve, I'm still going to consider it positive. For example, if I drive to Florida, I am from upstate New York. If I drive to Florida, I don't know, about 1,200 miles, 1,000, whatever. Say I drive 1,200 miles. I drive 1,200 miles to Florida. I drive 1,200 miles back. My total distance traveled would be 2,400 miles, okay? Because even though I drove down south 1,200 miles and I drove back up 1,200 miles, I don't consider any of them negative. If you want to say direction, down south would be negative. Absolute value bars make it positive. Okay, so I drive 12, uh, 2,400 miles total. If I want to figure out how far I am from where I started, that's displacement. That means my 1,200 south stays negative. And then coming back north, 1,200 would be positive. So I would have a net change, a displacement of zero. I ended up exactly where I started before I left, all right? And I don't think it's that difficult of a concept to get. Uh, for displacement, you basically need to include negative numbers, okay? For distance traveled, for total distance traveled, our negative numbers are going to make it positive because it doesn't matter if I went 1,200 miles south on my car, like the speedometer, or excuse me, the mileage on my car, it's going to give me 2,400 miles. When I drive to Florida, and I drive back, when I come back or whatever the case, it's not going to start negating miles. It's not going to go back to zero. I mean, every car would have, you know, negative miles on it, okay? Uh, it, my mileage is going to count every single mile. It doesn't matter what direction it is. That would be total distance traveled. So let's take a uh, look at a very easy, basic velocity graph. This is the top graph, okay? The graph below here is position. We'll get to that in a moment. But let's take a look at this top velocity graph right here. All right. Now, if I'm talking displacement, if I'm talking displacement, that means anything that's below my x-axis, I won't do that in blue, I'll do that in green. Anything below my x-axis, if this is velocity, velocity is negative down here, velocity is positive here. Okay, so any area under the curve that is above my x-axis needs to be considered positive. And any area below my x-axis needs to be considered negative. I want the value of the area under the curve when I consider all the area. And when we talk about value, true value, okay, we can need positives and negatives. So, real basic. And by real basic, what do I mean? Um, do, 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 highlighters. I like breaking these things up. Some people like to use trapezoids. I just like rectangles and triangles. Easy. The area of that square, that's a one-by-one one square. So the area is one, right in the middle of that square, I guess. The area of this triangle, okay, that is a one-by-one one triangle. Well, the area of a triangle is half base times height. 
So it's 1 half times 1 times 1, which is 1 half. So the area is right there. So basically, I have 1 and I have a half up here. Now, I have the same exact things below the x-axis. I have a triangle. Oh, man, look at me go. I wanted to color coordinate. Okay, I have this triangle right here, correct? That is still a 1 by 1 base and height times a half. A half times 1 times 1. Again, this area is a half. The only thing that's different is on this bottom here, mm, highlighted, this rectangle is not a square. It is a slightly bigger rectangle in terms of area than our square was above. It is literally, uh, okay, let's see here. This goes from 3 to 5. That has a width of 2 and a height of 1. Well, 2 times 1, this area is 2. So all the positives, if I add up all my positives, I have positive 1 and a half on top. If I consider all my negatives, I have negative two and a half on the bottom. And if I combine those two, I have 1.5 positive minus 2.5, so that's negative. Negative one should be my displacement, shouldn't it? And it sure is. I have my positive one on top, my positive half. Below the x-axis, I have my negative half and my negative two. That gives me negative one. Displacement. Now, if I want, okay, if I want the total distance, not just displacement, that means all of these need to be considered positive. This two and a half would have to be positive. Displacement. I don't care if it's going out or coming back. I'm going to count that distance as positive. I'm going to add it all together, which means I should include this two and a half as positive. It is no longer negative one but it becomes a positive 4 when I add that. Everything is positive, and it should be 4. Okay? Now, what's the deal with this position graph? This is just a throwback reminder. Every AP exam, I should scroll up with my little record buttons are in the way. Every AP exam I've seen, and I haven't done every one of them, but the ones that I've seen, they always have a problem that, requires students to interpret velocity and position graphs, or their first derivative, the second derivative graphs. You need to understand the relationship between graphs, okay? So as I erase this one right here, you'll see below my velocity graph, as soon as I get done erasing, da, 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 I have a position graph. And I'm just going to be a quick review to just relate the two. Now, velocity is the derivative of position, right? And by derivative, derivative is the same thing as slope, isn't it? So the slope of position is velocity. So if I look from 0 to 1, I have a constant slope of 1. And I look at my velocity from 0 to 1, it's constant. Now this is slope, right? As a constant slope of 1. It doesn't change. At 2, I have a slope of 0. That is a horizontal tangent line. So at 2, my slope is a 0. It's right on the x-intercept. Now, what happens? My positive slope becomes less and less steep. So my positive slope is decreasing. See, it comes, does this, does this, does this. It kind of gets smaller. And that's why my positive slope it approaches zero, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, from three to four, it look, actually to five, from three to five, this looks like it has a constant negative one slope. Okay, so from three to five, I'm at negative one, my slope, and it doesn't change. It stays at negative one. And in between two and three, it looks like it goes small negative to more and more negative, okay? So it goes smaller negative to more and more negative until it hits my negative one slope. So being able to understand the connection between the two is pretty important, okay? You're going to have to know that. That's good. There's going to be some sort of variation of that on the AP exam. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples uh, just with integration for real-life problems. 
and uh, the value of the area under the curve. Okay, so national potato consumption. Wow, a lot of potatoes because we are carb heavy people. You should love this problem unless you're on one of those, uh, you know, keto or Atkins diets where you're trying to cut out or have a very low carb diet, in which case you really can't stand people that eat potatoes, not because you don't like them in their choices and because you really want French fries and you can't eat it anymore and you're jealous. That's why. So the rate of potato consumption for a particular country was C, which stands for consumption, equals 2.2 plus 1.1 raised to the T. This is a T in case you couldn't tell. And really, this should be C of T. It's consumption with regard to the variable T for time. Okay? Now, it tells us where T is the number of years since 1970, and C, the consumption, is in millions. Now, for a very small change in T, the rate of consumption is a constant. Okay, so that very small change is a constant. And again, when we integrate, our little dummy variable, the dt, goes bye-bye. Okay, so the amount of potatoes consumed during the short time is, okay, the amount of potatoes consumed during that very short time is, well, I take my consumption and I multiply it by that very small change. Okay. That very small change. All right. So let's move forward. If we add up all these small amounts to get that total consumption, the total consumption would be the integration of the consumption dt. So this little kind of triangle t, you can kind of just think it just changes to dt. But let me, I mean, do you really need, I'm going to explain to you where it comes from, okay? First of all, let's go back here. And we got this thing right here. We've got CT times a small change in T. If I talk about consumption, here's my graph that represents consumption. I don't know, let's do this. The more and more people we have, the more and more potatoes we eat. Here's consumption, okay? If I am talking about area under the curve, right? This point right here, this might be my small change in T very bad triangle and this value is the y that's my c of t right so if i want this area there's my rectangle remember we used to do l rams and r rams it's a very large rectangle it is ct times change in t that's literally the measurement my height is the y value i don't know what it is we're just going to call it c of t my width is the x value it's t it's a change in t from this point to this point. I don't know what it is. I just call it delta t. So how do I figure out that area under the curve? I multiply that rectangle I have. And that's just what this is here, okay, in case you're going to put that together. So now, if I want all the consumption, I want to add up all my rectangles. Remember, we just kind of put all these little rectangles together? Okay, and that's where the integration, we're going to integrate, that adds up all of these areas of my function and then we just put with regard to the dummy variable of time because my consumption has the variable t so that's all that really means okay so if you were kind of like i don't understand how you went from one place to the other that's really what it's talking about okay so when we move forward we say okay total consumption i want the total area under this curve here i want all of this i want it all not just pieces, but when I want to all, I'm going to add up all these things together. That's integration, adding up all those rectangles. That's where LRAM comes from. That's where RRAM, MRAM, okay, Simpson's rule, the trapezoidal rule. Okay, we're adding up all of those small, small rectangles that we made. All right, or trapezoids for the trapezoidal rule. Now, <clears throat> from the beginning, of 1972 to the end of 1973 all right we are going to set up our integral as such i am going to put my function c okay let's not forget 
our function C is this right here, 2.2 .2 plus 1.1 to the T. All right. I'm going to put that right here in for C. Okay. It was C dt, but in for C, I'm putting this right here. All right. Now, what is one of the very, very quick things that you can forget? Okay. First of all, C of T, I'm replacing with this because this is C of T. Okay. I still have my dt. It's a dummy variable. When I integrate it, it's going to go bye bye. Now, as you work through this quickly, quick work makes for small mistakes. Make sure you do it thoroughly. Yes, you can do it with a little bit of, of quickness, but you shouldn't be racing to get through here. Remember, my t variable represents time since 1970. This is obviously 2. That's why my lower limit is 2. How come this is not 3? Because it's to the end of 1973. So that includes the whole year of 1973. The end means January through December. That's one full year. Okay, I have all of 1972. Yep, I'll be okay from beginning to end. I also have all of 1973 from beginning to end. So that's two years. So right at the start of 1974 is where I'm stopping. Okay, so I want to include all of this year and all of this year. That's two years. Okay, that's why I go to four. I want to include both of those years in their entirety. Okay, to the end of 1973. And I, used, I normally have to explain that in class, which is why I'm explaining it right now. Now, if I integrate these things, all right, let's not forget the integration of a constant, I just add the variable back in when I integrate it. This is a rule, okay? This is my exponential rule, okay? It's 1 over my base, 1 over the ln of my base. It's 1 over the ln of my base, which is 1.1, times the base, okay? And we throw our t right there. And that's why I have this right here. And I want this whole thing from 4 to 2 still. So, from 4 to 2. Now, of course, I hope you put that in a calculator. You are not going to be able to calculate that second term without a calculator. And you should get approximately, if they want it in millions, because my C is in millions, it's 7.066 millions of bushels. That's a lot of fries. Um, I wish that would go away and have someone stuffing their face with fries, but maybe next year I'll make that change. Work. Oh, man, why can't I just win the Powerball and not work? That would be awesome. Work, 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 work. Okay, so work equals force times distance, right? It's a basic equation for physics, for science, for anything. Work equals, it should be frustration times misery. That's the adult version of the equation. Work is just force times distance. Now, calculating the work is easy when the force and distance are constants. Okay, if my force was 2 and my distance was 8, well, 2 times 8 is 16. But when the amount of force varies, we get to use calculus. How cool is it that we know calculus? It's pretty darn cool. Yeah. Oh, you don't know calculus? Be a lot cooler if you did. Anyways, let's move forward. All right, so now that we know what work is, let's move forward and kind of apply that to an object, okay? Hooks. Law for springs, okay? F equals K times X. K is a spring constant. Okay, every spring has its own sort of constant, so to speak, depending on the thickness, the length, whatever. Now, x is the distance the spring has moved beyond its normal length. So if I take this spring here and I stretch the ends this way and this way, I am stretching it beyond its normal resting length. That's what x is in this case. All right, simple enough. Now let's take it a step further. 
that we still have Hooke's law, f equals kx, k is the spring constant, and x is the distance beyond the normal length, okay? And let's read what they give us here. It takes 10 newtons, okay? It takes 10 newtons to stretch a spring two meters beyond its natural length, all right? So if I apply this to my equation here, I get the following. Newtons is my force. <clears throat> force equals K times my X. What's my X? Two meters. It moves the spring two meters beyond its natural length. So my X is two. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that two times what is ten? Five. So now I know that my K is five. Now, if I still use my equation and I put my spring constant in there, I can use this equation to determine other things. That is my constant for this particular spring right here. Okay? That's my constant. So now I can do all sorts of calculations for this particular spring. And you'll notice here this, this little groovy, groovy diagram. Here's my spring in its uh, natural length, okay? If I pull the spring up two meters, okay, two meters beyond its natural length, it requires a force of 10 newtons, okay? And we've, uh, we've pretty much figured that out. So how much work, 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 I just, that song is in my head now. How much work is done by stretching the spring to four meters beyond its natural length? So I want to figure out the total amount of work done. I'm going to add up the area under the curve to determine my work. In that case, I'm going to integrate. All right. I'm going to integrate my equation 5x dx from zero, from my, when my spring is resting at normal length, to four meters beyond its natural length. I don't want just the equation at four. I want to know all that work that's done to get it through one, two, three, and four. How much work is that going to require in total? All right? So I integrate. If I integrate 5x, this is 5x to the one. I add one to that exponent and make it two, and I divide by that 2. And I want that from 4 to 0. So it's 5 times 4 squared over 2 minus 5 times 0 squared over 2. Have I mentioned how much I love plugging 0 into numbers? It's just fantastic because anything times 0 is 0 and it goes away. 4 squared is 16. 5 times 16 is 80. 80 divided by 2 is 40. 80 divided by 2 is 40. Now, this is a rate we're discovering, so that would be for my work, all right? Work is newtons. Newtons. So I need newtons per minute because, or no, minute. I, I'll be okay. It's a distance. It's newtons per meter. And there you go. That's it. I know some of the homework problems talk about work, so I wanted to go over one that dealt with work. All right? Um, that's it. I mean, there's a couple more lessons in Unit 7, maybe four or five total. Uh, then we're going to start reviewing. So I will see you for Unit 7, Lesson 2, coming up in the near future. To a theater near you, in the land far away. And oh, by the way, today I'm recording this video on March 14th. It's Pi Day. How cool is that? Make sure you hug your favorite math teacher. But, you know, don't get too close because that's weird. But, you know, appreciate them in some way, shape, or form that is not invasive of their personal space. I'll see you.